So this is the second part. Last week we talked a little bit more about physiology of the kidneys. So in the second part of uh, the urinary system, we'll talk about some of the factors that influence filtration, pressure, and the rate of filtration formation. Now glomerular filtration involves the passage across the filtration membrane. These are the cells or the cell lining that's involved in the glomerulus. There are three components of the glomerular membrane. There's capillary endothelium, there's the lamina densa, and the filtration slits which uh, form this membrane. And the glomerular capillaries, they're fenestrated, little tiny windows sit in the capillaries. These are essentially pores. They uh, measure about 60 to 100 nanometers. Obviously, since we've had to review, you know I'm not going to ask you the size, but they're just very small, but there are openings uh, in these blood vessels. They prevent the passage of blood cells, so they're too small for blood cells, but they do allow the passage of solutes such as sodium, potassium, calcium, and other electrolytes, including plasma proteins. And remember, plasma proteins are bigger than the electrolytes uh, themselves. The lamina densa is more selective. It allows diffusion only of small plasma proteins, nutrients, and ions. The filtration slits are the finest filters. They have gaps of about six to nine um, nanometers uh, in uh, diameter. They prevent the passage of the most smallest plasma proteins. Now, glomerular filtration is governed by the balance between hydrostatic pressure, which is the fluid pressure, and then the collard os osmotic pressure. These are the materials that are actually inside the solute. The more concentrated the solutes are, the greater the colloid osmotic pressure. In other words, it's going to draw fluid from the outside, from the tissue areas that are outside these tubular processes. Now, in, so this is based upon the amount of solute that's inside that solution. Hydrostatic pressure is the amount of volume, the pressure that's put on those, on those capillary walls by the sheer amount of pressure that's there and would cause fluid to leak out of those fenestrated windows. So this is what's going to be on either side of the capillary walls. And blood uh, pressure in the glomerular capillaries, it tends to push water and solute molecules out of plasma into the filtrate and significantly high capillary pressures, such as in the systemic circuit in the body, is due to arrangement of vessels in the glomerulus. Now remember the kidneys are very sensitive to the pressure in the system. That's based upon the actions of the afferent and efferent arterioles being able to sense what the systemic pressure is. As we see blood leaving the glomerular capillaries, it flows into the efferent arterioles with a diameter smaller than the afferent arterioles. The efferent arterioles produce resistance. This requires a relatively high pressure to force blood into that area. This opposes the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. Again, this is the water, the force of the volume that's inside the vessel, pushes water and solutes out of the filtrate into the plasma areas. The results of the resistance of the flow along the nephrons in the conducting system it averages a pressure of about 15 millimeters of pressure, and if you remember inside the, uh, the right ventricle of the heart in that chamber, the pressure measures about 16 millimeters of pressure, so it gives you some relative idea about how much pressure we're talking about on the, uh, the uh, left ventricle side, which again is where most of the pressure is generated. We get a uh, a uh, diastolic pressure, the low pressure on the blood pressure, you get about 80 millimeters of mercury and some people it's a bit higher up to when it contracts during systole you get as high as 120 millimeters of pressure or even higher. So it gives you some relative idea of the different types of pressures that you're looking at when you look at the kidneys. The hydrostatic pressure is the difference between the glomerular hydrostatic pressure and the capsular hydrostatic pressure. You don't really need to know that. The colloid osmotic pressure, which I referred to on the review, is of solution and osmotic pressure resulting from the presence of suspended proteins. Now, it's also reflective of other solutes that are in the solution as well. The amount of sodium that's there, the amount of potassium that's there, but primarily the biggest constituent of the solutes it would be the proteins, the suspended proteins are in solution. So this colloid pressure, the solute concentration, would cause substances, water, free water, to be absorbed into the tubular network here. So reabsorption would take place based upon that solute concentration. That's why patients with kidney disease, if you see a tremendous loss of protein, then those individuals are losing kidney tissue. 
but because proteins typically are reabsorbed and you don't see proteins excreted in urine because the proteins help us maintain our volume level. So when you see a, a tremendous loss of protein, then you know something's wrong, so a disease process is going on with the kidneys. Uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure tends to draw water out of the filtrate into the plasma, opposes filtration. Again, average pressure, 25 millimeters of pressure. I'm not going to ask you any pressure questions. I'm just giving you some relative numbers so you can have some idea of what we're talking about. Now, so when you look at the blood and you look at the filtration pressure, you can see the little windows here in the slits. And remember, these cells, the cells of the uh, collecting ducts of the kidneys, are in close approximation with the uh, uh, vascular space and because of this through solute concentrations and other co-transport mechanisms substances can be brought through. If the pressure inside the um, uh, filtrate space and the capsular space is high then certain substances will be pushed through hydrostatic pressure. If the solute concentration is higher here, protein concentration, sodium potassium, then fluids will be brought out of, the, uh, out of the vessel to change the pressure inside the capsule versus changing the pressure here. The other effects of substances that we'll talk about a little further if we have time today, aldosterone and uh, angiotensin will also have a primary effect of determining what the concentrations are and where the fluid is at based upon what the kidney senses the pressure out in the system to be. The average pressure uh, the filtration pressure is basically the average pressure of forcing water and other dissolved materials outside the glomerular capillary and into the capsular space. Uh, at the glomerulus, there's a difference between hydrostatic pressure and colloid osmotic pressure across glomerular capillaries. Um, now, glomerular filtration rate. should be familiar with this term and read about this a little more so you know you have a clear understanding of glomerular filtration rate. This is the amount of filtrate the kidney produces in any one minute. Average is about 125 cc's a minute. About 10% of fluid delivered to the kidney leaves in the bloodstream and enters into the capsular space. Through that, those little fenestrated windows and the relationship between the capillaries and the capsule of, uh, of the kidneys. Uh, a creatinine clearance test. This test is what's used in clinical settings to determine what the glomerular filtration rate of the kidneys are. It's a direct reflection of the function of the kidney. A more accurate glomerular filtration test uses a substance called inulin. And what you want is a substance that's permeable through that capillary and capsule interface. Uh, and creatinine is the perfect substance for that. Inulin, you don't see that many inulin studies done. But uh, typically what you use is uh, the glomerular filtration rate is the measure of creatinine. Glomerular generates about 180 liters of filtrate per day. 99% of that is reabsorbed in the renal tubules, 99%. Glomerular filtration rate depends on the filtration pressure. Any factors that can alter that pressure will alter the glomerular filtration rate. There are three levels of controls, the three mechanisms that help control the glomerular filtration rate. Autoregulation at a local level, hormonal regulation, which maybe we'll get a chance to talk about, and then the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of the uh, uh, nervous system, primarily sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And remember for the exam, I asked you to make sure you could identify the sympathetic, uh, what the sympathetic innervation does to the kidneys. Autoregulation, maintaining uh, GFR, despite changes in local blood pressure and blood flow, changes in diameter of afferent arterioles, efferent arterioles, and glomerular capillaries. Re uh, the autoregulation also reduces blood flow of the glomerular blood pressure, triggers dilatation of the afferent arterioles and dilatation of glomerular capillaries, and constriction of efferent arterioles. In autoregulation, you also see a rise in renal blood pressure. The stretch walls of the afferent arterioles causes the smooth muscles to contract. When you see constriction of the afferent arterioles, it decreases the glomerular blood flow and thus will slow down glomerular filtration rate. Now, hormonal regulation is based upon the enzymes renin, the renin angiotensin system, and a natriuretic uh, peptide, AMP and BMP. And I know we talked about each one of these uh, in the endocrine system, so I won't be redundant. But the renin angiotensin system basically causes the juxtaglomerular apparatus. You know where that interface is between the uh, 
uh, proximal convoluted tubules in the capsule itself. It triggers the release of renin. And then when we see renin angiotensin system triggered, we'll see a decline in blood pressure to the glomerulus. This is due to decrease in blood volume. You see a fall in systemic pressure due to blockage of the renal arteries or tributaries. Remember, the kidneys are dependent upon this blood volume. So if there's a fall in the systemic pressure, fall in systemic pressure can be due to uh, an obstruction in the renal artery. There's a disease process called renal artery stenosis. And in renal artery stenosis, the, uh, the blood vessel, the artery that leads into the kidney is not pliable enough. And so it doesn't adjust to changes in pressure. The kidney sense that it's not enough blood volume. The person's blood pressure can be fine or even high, but because of renal artery stenosis and not enough blood getting to the kidneys, the afferent arterial sense that it's not enough blood volume, so they trigger off this, ang this renin angiotensin system to send out more aldosterone, hold on to more fluid, cause vasoconstriction peripherally. Angiotensin II is a powerful vasoconstrictor. And so the body's response, the kidney's response is, I'm not getting enough blood, and so I have to do all of these things to make sure I get enough blood, but it sends the blood pressure up in the system so very high, and it's very difficult to control because the regulating system of the kidney has been changed because the blood vessel won't open up, won't constrict and contract, it's stenosed. And so the, the, the kidney starts sending out false information that the body's uh, pressure is low. And these, pa these patients have extremely malignant hypertension, very difficult to control their blood pressure because of the renin-angiotensin renin system. But this is because, uh, again, an abnormality in the blood flow, blockage of the renal artery and are the tributaries of the renal artery as well. Oops, sorry. <laughs> That's it. Okay, uh, stimulation of the justal glomerular cells by sympathetic innervation due to a decline in osmotic concentration in the tubular fluid at the macula densa. Again, stimulation of uh, the justal glomerular by the sympathetic nervous system can trigger this mechanism. And then angiotensin II, which constricts efferent arterioles of the nephron, elevating the glomerular pressure by filtration rate, stimulates the reabsorption of sodium ion. Remember, water's going to go where the sodium goes. So if you stimulate sodium ion reabsorption in water, this is at the point of the proximal convoluted tubule. Stimulate the secretion of aldosterone by the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone accelerates sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule in the cortical portion of the collecting system. Angiotensin II in the central nervous system stimulates the thirst mechanism. So if you stimulate the thirst mechanism, you're going to take in more water. You've already stimulated the reabsorption of aldosterone, so you're going to reabsorb more sodium. You drink more water, you also reabsorb more water, which means you're going to increase the blood volume. And this is how that mechanism will elevate the pressure, again, because the kidneys are sensing that they're not getting enough pressure. Triggers the release of antidiuretic hormone. Triggering the antidiuretic hormone stimulates the reabsorption of water in the distal portion of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting system. Uh, it also increases sympathetic motor tone, mobilizing venous reserves, increasing cardiac output, and stimulating peripheral vasoconstriction. The angiotensin II in the peripheral capillary beds causes a brief but powerful vasoconstriction. Just remember angiotensin II, a very powerful uh, vasoconstrictor. Uh, this is, occurs in the arterioles and in the capillary and the precapillary sphincters, elevating arterial pressure throughout the body. So again, kidneys sense that it did not have an adequate amount of systemic pressure, and these are the mechanisms that fall into place that will immediately cause the reabsorption of sodium, re reabsorption of fluid volumes, again stimulating increased pressure because typically if you increase the pressure, you increase the flow. And so uh, systemically, the release of these substances causes a systemic increase in blood pressure, which hopefully will increase the uh, blood flow to the kidney. The overall effect of angiotensin II, increase in the systemic blood volume and the blood pressure and restoration of the normal glomerular filtration rate. Again, it's all about the kidneys. The kidneys will has, has to sense an adequate amount of pressure in the system for it to be able to function effectively. Um, the uh, increase in blood volume 
automatically increases glomerular filtration rate to promote loss of fluid. Hormonal factors further increase in glomerular filtration rate, accelerating fluid loss in urine. Now, the natriuretic peptides, as we talked about in the endocrine system, uh, they are released by the heart in response to stretching walls of the heart. So this is due to increased blood volume and blood pressure. The heart, too, has a sense, uh, can sense blood volume and blood pressure. The heart's response to low blood pressure is to increase heart rate. Uh, again, there are pressure receptors. We talked about the carotid bodies that were located in carotid arteries that will barrel receptors that help sense um, uh, pressure in the cardiovascular system. But again, released by the heart, this nat uh, natriuretic uh, peptide uh, is very important and again is based upon the response of the stretching walls in the heart muscle itself due to increased blood volume or blood pressure. Atrial natriuretic peptide is released by the atria and then the brain natriuretic peptide is released by the ventricles. Um, it triggers the dilatation of afferent arterioles and constriction of efferent arterioles and elevates the glomerular pressure and increases glomerular filtration rate. It increases tubular reabsorption of sodium, again increased reabsorption of sodium, increase in the tubules, the water is going to follow the sodium, so if you've increased sodium reabsorption in the tubules, the water is going to come into the tubules, and so you'll see increased urine production, decreased blood volume and pressure, all based upon what the heart now sensed as the blood pressure uh, of the system. Autonomic regulation of the glomerular filtration rate mostly consists of sympathetic postganglionic fibers, in other words, sympathetic nervous system is activating it. Sympathetic activation constricts afferent arterioles, it decreases the glomerular filtration rate, and it slows the filtrate production. Um, you also see changes in blood flow to the kidneys due to sympathetic stimulation, may be opposed by autoregulation and our local mechanisms, and all these mechanisms have to work. Uh, together. Some of the key concepts to focus on, the glomerular produces about 180 liters of filtrate per day, 70 times that of plasma volume. Almost all of the fluid volume must be reabsorbed to, avo to avoid fatal dehydration. So all the fluid is processed through the kidneys. All the fluid, all the 25 percent of cardiac output at any given time, 12 to 1800 liters of uh, cc's of fluid are coming through each minute, but yet of all that fluid, the overwhelming majority of it is reabsorbed back into the system. So almost all the fluid volume must be reabsorbed. If not, pr people that suffer from diabetes insipidus, which is just complete loss of urine flow and adequate production of antidiuretic hormone, these people will dehydrate. Conditions like diabetic ketoacidosis, where there is a tremendous amount of sugar being spilled into the uh, collecting system. Sugar is a solute. And so because the concentration inside the tubules is so concentrated, it draws fluid from the rest of the body. And so now all the fluid is going into the collecting system and being lost with the, uh, the urine and sugar. So you shouldn't have sugar in your urine. You shouldn't have uh, a significant number of white blood cells in your urine. You shouldn't have blood in your urine. And you should not have a large amount of protein in your urine. One to two cells eh, may be OK. but those, those things should not be in the urine. Urine should be crystal clear. You can always do the taste test and see for sure. Urine is sterile. You can do that. It's sterile. Urine is sterile. Guys really like that because we don't have to wash our hands when we come out of the bath. I'm sorry. Okay. What types, of <laughs> what types of transport mechanisms are found along the nephron and what are the reabsorption and secretory functions of each segment of the nephron in the collecting system? Okay. Reabsorption and secretion. Reabsorption recovers uh, useful, um, okay, Re reabsorption and secretion. Reabsorption recovers useful material from filtrate. Secretion ejects waste products, toxins, and other desirable sol solutes. Reabsorption and secretion also involves and occurs in every segment of the nephron except for the renal corpuscle. Relatively important to changes from segment to segment. This is just a look at the transport uh, activities in the proximal convoluted tubules. In the proximal convoluted tubules, normally we reabsorb about 60 to 70 percent of the filtrate produced in the renal corpuscle. Reabsorbed materials enter the peritubular fluid and diffuse into the peritubular capillaries. Five functions of the proximal convoluted tubule. Reabsorption of organic nutrients, active reabsorption of ions, 
reabsorption of water, passive reabsorption of ions and secretions. And I will try to, and I'm not going to promise this, but I will try to, and I'll say it on me, I'll try to go through these and I'll try to highlight them, but I don't know if I have time to do that and get the test out as well. I keep thinking about because I did say that last week that I would highlight. So I'll, I'll try, but I'm not going to promise. I'll try. Uh, but five functional proximal convolute tubule. Important to know, I don't think I tested you on this specifically, but this is an important concept because you need to know what the role of the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle. And there's a lot of reabsorption exchange of electrolytes going on in each process. The five fun functions of proximal convoluted tubule, again, reabsorption of organic nutrients, active reabsorption of ions, reabsorption of water, and passive reabsorption of ions and secretion. Sodium reabsorption, very important. Where the sodium goes, that's where the water's going to go. That's what contains and that's what involves and that's what maintains the volume that we see in the system. So it's important in every proximal convoluted tubule in the process, we see ions will enter into these tubular cells by diffusion, leaks through the channel, sodium linked co-transport mechanisms of organic solutes and counter-transport mechanisms in hydrogen ions. Now you know the other two players. Remember I talked about facilitated diffusion, passive diffusion. Now you also see trans counter-transport and co-transport as mechanisms by which solutes come in. That was a test question. Uh, what is the role of counter-transport multiplication in the formation of concentration gradients in the renal medulla? Well, we have reabsorption, 60 to 70 percent of filtrate volume produced in the glomerulus is reabsorbed in the tubular fluid as it reaches the loop of Henle. That's the lower limb when we look at the nephron. The loop of Henle reabsorbs about half the water and two-thirds of the sodium and chloride ions remaining in the tubular fluid by a process called countercurrent exchange. Countercurrent uh, multiplication, an exchange that occurs between two parallel segments in the loop of Henle, the thin descending loop and the thick ascending loop of Henle. In the countercurrent, that refers to the exchange between tubular fluids moving in opposite directions. Fluid in the descending limb follows through the renal pelvis, and then fluid in the ascending limb will follow through towards the cortex of the kidney. Um, the term multiplication just refers to the effect of exchange, increases the movement of fluid in, as it continues. Then there are parallel segments in the uh, loop of Henle. In other words, they're lined up very close together. I think your book has an illustration that kind of lines up all the nephrons, all the little loops of Henle are lined there together, uh, separated only by very thin uh, peritubular fluid. has very different permeability and characteristics located in each of the segments. In the thin descending limb, permeable to water, relatively impermeable to solutes, and then in the thick ascending limb, we see relatively impermeable to water and solutes, contains active transport mechanisms, a sodium uh, chloride pump, uh, which basically will pump across a concentration gradient, sodium and our chloride, then from tubular fluid into peritubular fluid of the medulla. Now these pumps that move sodium and chloride across concentration gradients, they elevate osmotic concentration gradients in the peritubular fluid and around the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle. It causes osmotic flow of water out of thin descending limb and then in the peritubular fluid. This increases the solute concentration uh, in the descending or the thin loop of Henle. Um, and then these concentrated solutions will then arrive back to the ascending portion of the limb. It accelerates the sodium and chloride transport into peritubular fluids. In the ascending limb, we see increased uh, solute concentration, and we see uh, an acceleration of solutes pumping in the ascending limb. You can't read that. I can't read that. <laughs> then that came out too well. Uh, Countercurrent multiplication, active transporter of apical surfaces, which moves sodium, potassium, chloride out of the tubular fluid. And then you can, it uses carrier proteins, which is the transporter, to be able to move sodium and potassium across these concentration gradients. Each cycle pumps carries ions, ions, sodium ions, potassium ions, and chloride ions. The total number is not so important to you. That's not what I'm trying to get you to appreciate. Just for you to appreciate the exchange and the importance of solute concentrations and then making the fluid 
And one of the reasons why the kidneys are so effective in reabsorbing fluid, because typically if this was just a passive process and you could get sodium to diffuse out across the peritubial membranes into the capillary membranes, then there would be no reason for fluid to be aggressively reabsorbed back into the kidneys. But by this pump, where you can actually change the concentration gradient. Remember, pumps require energy. So now you can get a higher concentration of sodium in wherever area that you need the additional sodium to attract more fluid, to increase volume for reabsorption, or in the case of when you need to excrete more, you don't pump as much sodium, more sodium is retained in the serum, more um, fluid is then retained back into the vascular system. So it depends on where the volume is needed. Potassium ions can be pumped into the paratubular fluid by co-transport carriers or removed from the paratubular fluid by sodium potassium exchange pump to diffuse back into the lumen of the tubules through potassium leaks and channels. Sodium and chloride ions removed from the tubular fluid in the ascending limb of Henle will elevate the osmotic concentration in the paratubular fluid around the descending limb. And then in the thin limb, we see that's permeable to water, impermeable to solutes, and as tubular fluid follows through along the uh, descending limb, we'll see a, the process of osmosis which moves water into paratubular fluid, it leaves all the solute behind, and then osmotic concentration in the paratubular fluid will increase. Now, the thick ascending limb has a highly effective pumping mechanism, two-thirds of the sodium and chloride in the system are pumped out of the tubular fluid before it reaches the distal convoluted tubule, and then the, uh, remember, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, solute concentration in the tubular fluid then declines. Now the fluid in the distal convoluted tubule arrives at a, a concentration gradient of about 100 osma. You, this, that uh, number you don't have to worry about. Just recognize that the concentration of the paratubular fluid in the, the uh, renal cortex is about a third of the concentration than what we've looked at before. The rate of ion transport across the thick ascending limb is proportional to ion concentrations in the paratubular fluid. There are some regional differences between where sodium and potassium will be pumped into and out of the medulla, starting at the thick limb and then near the cortex. There are some regional differences in ion transport rates which causes concentration gradients in the medulla. We also will see concentration gradients in the cortex as well, but most of the activity is taking place inside the medulla. The paratubular fluid near the turn of the loop of Henle again measures at a higher osmolarity of about 1200, and two-thirds of the sodium and chloride are pumped out of the ascending limb, and the remainder from urea. Urea, again, produced in the liver, transported to the kidneys for excretion. <clears throat> a thick ascending limb uh, of the loop of Henle in the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts are impermeable to urea. As water is reabsorbed, the concentration of urea will rise uh, because this is how the system is getting rid of urea. We don't want to retain urea, so we won't see that, we'll see that it won't be reabsorbed. Tubular fluid reaching the uh, uh, papillary ducts of the kidneys, which are permeable to urea. Uh, concentration of medulla usually elevates to about 450. So the efficiency of reabsorption of solutes and concentration is a part of this multiplication process, and this is the countercurrent process. So before tubular fluid reaches the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting system, because again, follow this process of reabsorption, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting duct. Okay? And we're almost getting to urine production now. It establishes a concentration gradient permits passive reabsorption of water from tubular fluid in the collecting system. It's regulated by circulating levels of antidiuretic hormone. Composition and volume of tubular fluid changes from the capsular space to the distal convoluted tubule, and rightfully so. There's been a tremendous amount now of absorption and reabsorption of solutes and fluids. 15 to 20 percent of the initial filtrate volume, only 15 to 20 percent of initial filtrate volume will reach the distal convoluted tubules. Concentrations of electrolytes and organic waste that arrive at the tubular fluid no longer resemble the uh, blood plasma. 
You'll see reabsorption and secretion in the distal convoluted tubule, selective reabsorption and secretion primarily along the distal convoluted tubules, makes final adjustment in the solute concentration and the volume of the tubular fluid. Active transport or actively transported sodium and potassium out of the tubular cells or tubular fluid. This is along the distal portion of the limb. It contains ion pumps, reabsorbs tubular sodium in exchange for potassium. Now, the effects of aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone produced from the adrenal cortex, controls ion pump and channels, stimulates synthesis and incorporation of sodium pumps and channels uh, in cell membranes along the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts. It reduces sodium loss in the urine. In cases of hypokalemia produced by prolonged aldosterone uh, stimulation, hypokalemia now refers to low potassium level in the serum, in the blood, dangerously reduces plasma concentration. Now that's important. We need potassium in the system. Potassium in the system is involved in the electrical conduction of, say, uh, electrical impulses such as in the heart, and so low potassium levels can be dangerous. The uh, natriuretic peptides oppose the secretion of aldosterone. Its action is on the distal convoluted tubules and in the collecting ducts. There's also parathyroid hormone and calcitriol, which we talked about in the endocrine system. Circulating levels regulate reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubules. Secretion at the distal convoluted tubules. Blood entering the paratubular capillaries will contain some undesirable substances they didn't cross the filtration membrane at the glomerulus. We also see the rate of potassium and hydrogen ion concentration or hydrogen ion secretion will rise or fall. Now remember hydrogen ion concentration is importantly regulated in the kidneys because this tremendously affects the acid base balance uh, of the system. Uh, potassium ions diffuse into the lumen through potassium channels. This is at uh, the apical surface of the tubular system. These cells will exchange sodium um, with potassium, so excess potassium um, uh, is important to get rid of in bodily fluids. Now, too much potassium in the fluid, in the blood volume, is also equally as dangerous as having too little potassium. Too much potassium, uh, which is a condition that we see in individuals, is an indicator that the kidneys are not functioning properly. Patients who suffer from end-stage renal disease and are on dialysis typically are very hyperkalemic or extremely high potassium levels. That's because the kidneys are responsible for excreting the excess potassium. So if the kidneys aren't functioning properly, if the cells of the kidneys have died, then we don't see this exchange for, of sodium for potassium. And in the serum, in the blood volume, the person starts to accumulate more potassium. So a very typical sign uh, that you see in a patient with end-stage renal disease. Uh, for hydrogen ions, they're generated in association uh, of uh, or dissociation of carbonic acid by an enzyme referred to as carbonic anhydrase. <clears throat> this is associated with the reabsorption of sodium. It's secreti secreted by sodium-linked countertransport in exchange for sodium in tubular fluid. Bicarbonate ions will diffuse into the bloodstream and buffer the changes in plasma pH. So the buffering system there is important and again based upon what's being secreted in the kidneys. Hydrogen ion secretion acidifies tubular fluids, elevates blood pH, and accelerates the blood pH and fall. Now um, you saw the wide range of differences that you see in the urine pH. Urine pH can run anywhere from four to say eight, sometimes 8.5 to nine. And it's because the kidneys are responsible for regulating the blood pH. And it does that by either excreting more hydrogen ions, and in that case, the urine's gonna be more acidic, or in turn, it may secrete, uh, it may produce more bicarbonate to neutralize uh, 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 acidic pHs in the system, but some of that's gonna spill in the urine so the pH may have a very high level in the urine as well. But all of that, so the, the urine, the kidneys are allowed to have this wide range of pH, but the system itself in the serum, in our blood volume, our pH needs to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. But you see a much wider range uh, when we talk about uh, the kidneys. So some causes of acidosis, 
Lactic acidosis is one of those conditions. Uh, if you go back to AMP1, we talked about lactic acidosis when we talked about the muscle system and how exhaustive, repetitive muscle activity can develop um, a lactic acidosis. Um, again, this is a based upon anaerobic metabolism. A lot of anaerobic metabolism is good in developing muscle, but to an extreme, producing lactic acid will definitely affect the uh, serum pH. Ketoacidosis, this is the development of starvation uh, based upon a disease condition referred to as diabetic uh, uh, mellitus. What happens in ketoacidosis is the blood cells have to have glucose. If blood cells don't get enough glucose, they send a signal to the brain, hey, we need more sugar. And if you're not getting it in the diet, then the muscles and the liver will start breaking down glycogen. In this process of breaking down glycogen, they use lactic, uh, lactic acid is generated, but also ketones are generated, and ketones are very acidic. Now, we need that as an energy source. Now, the problem in diabetes mellitus is not that the body doesn't have enough sugar. If you measure the sugar of a person that's in diabetic ketoacidosis, your blood sugar, normal blood sugar is 90 to 110. And a di person with diabetic ketoacidosis, their blood sugar is 600, 800, 900, even higher. So it's not that it's not enough sugar in the system. It's just the sugar is not in the red blood cell. For the sugar to get in the red blood cell, you have to have insulin. And in diabetes, the body is not producing enough insulin. For some reason, the pancreas, the beta cells in the pancreas, studied this in the endocrine system, is not producing enough insulin. And so there is sugar there. But because it's not in the cell, the body doesn't think it has enough sugar. So it sent the message to the brain to break down glycogen stores. Glycogen stores are broken down, generating lactic acid and also generating ketones. Ketones are very acidic. And so now this person is very acidic. They have a tremendous amount of sugar in the serum. And they're dumping sugar in their kidneys because that sugar, 25% of cardiac output goes to the kidneys, right? 25% of blood sugar is now going to the kidneys, and the kidneys have now been uh, dumping, they're trying to get rid of the sugar, and so the kidneys are now excreting a tremendous amount of sugar. You measure that in uh, your analysis and you see, wow, person has a lot of sugar. Good indication that the person is diabetic. And so when this happens, the, uh, the person will dehydrate. Why? because you've changed the solute concentration in the collecting ducts. If you have a lot of sugar in the collecting ducts, that's a solute. So now the kidneys are also going to absorb water, just like with sodium or a lot of protein. They're going to absorb water from everywhere based on the colloid osmotic pressure. Remember colloid osmotic? This is, um, the whole picture is coming together now, right? I'm hoping. Uh, and so now you've got to increase colloid pressure. And so we're drawing all the fluid into the collecting duct of the kidney. You're urinating. You're going like a racehorse. So you're dumping plenty of urine. There's sugar in the, the, the urine, but you still don't have sugar inside the cell because you haven't produced enough insulin. So the person is acidotic. They're a diabetic. They have ketones, diabetic ketoacidosis. And that's how the whole system works. And that, it's a beautiful thing. I just I, we have to appreciate it, I guess. Uh, now, control of blood pH. So now, what the kidneys have to do is because produced all that uh, that acid in the system, hydrogen ion level is just off the roof. So by hydrogen ion removal and by carbonate production at the kidneys, the kidneys will help to maintain homeostasis. The kidneys now are doing everything they can to try to bring the body back to a steady state. It's dumping out as much glucose as it can. It's dumping out as much hydrogen ions as it can. It's producing as much bicarbonate as it can. Um, but the system is, uh, is awry in diabetic ketoacidosis. But the kidneys, for its function, trying to maintain homeostasis, is doing everything it can in these extreme conditions. Now, alkalosis, abnormally high pH, can be caused by prolonged aldosterone stimulation which stimulates uh, secretion. In the proximal convoluted tubule, 
in a proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule. You deaminate amino acid, which ties up uh, hydrogen ions. It yields ammonium ions, and it yields also bicarbonate. Ammonium ions are pumped into the tubular fluid. Bicarbonate ions will enter the bloodstream in the peritubular fluid. Provides carbon chains for catabolism and generates bicarbonate ions to buffer plasma. You see the reabsorption and secretion along the collecting ducts, which receives tubular fluids from nephrons. This will carry it toward the renal sinus. You'll also see regulated, regulation of or regulating of water and solute lost in the collecting system. Two methods, aldosterone, secrete aldosterone, controls sodium ion pumps, opposes the natriuretic peptide, and then also secretion of antidiuretic hormone, which controls the permeability of water through the collecting system and will suppress by uh, the natriuretic uh, peptide. So aldosterone and ADH, very important in controlling uh, the volume in the system based upon where the salt's going to go, retain the salt, retain the fluid, antidiuretic hormone, decrease the permeability in the collecting system, which makes you hold on to more water. Sodium um, on uh, reabsorption, bicarbonate reabsorption and urea reabsorption, we see that in the collecting system. Secre uh, secretions in the collecting system, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, which will in turn control pH. We see low pH in peritubial fluid, which carrier proteins will pump hydrogen ions in the tubular spaces and reabsorb bicarbonate. All of this is an attempt to control and regulate the pH concentration. And then we'll see a secretion of bicarbonate ions and pumps hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ions back into the peritubular space, which will effectively neutralize this alkalosis or the increase in pH that we see in the system. So reabsorption, last two key concepts we'll hit you with. Reabsorption involves diffusion, osmosis, channel-mediated diffusion, and active transport. That was a test question. And many processes are independently regulated by local and hormonal mechanisms. Primary mechanisms governing water reabsorption, water follows the salt. Secretion is selective carrier-mediated process. And I think we'll stop it right there. Okay. Thank you very much.